mafia-oriented gangs so that they can go there and that's one of the groups that will take them regardless of their ethnic identification. So I'm just wondering, when you're talking about religious gangs, you're going to be talking about that in the context of all kinds of other yeah. gangs and the interactions and between them. Yeah, and, and protection is, is the right word to use there. And sometimes that's used as, um, uh, as a lure to draw people into groups, uh, saying, well, if you don't join us, you are going to be vulnerable. And, and you, you may be uh, exploited, you may be attacked, um, and worse, if you don't join our group. So there is a sort of protection racket going on. And sometimes it's done under the heading of religion, not always, uh, religion and or ethnicity. So, so that is quite an issue. But it also gets to the point I was trying to make earlier about um, diversity within religious traditions. So that some of the tensions that, that I've observed in British prisons is between Sunni Muslims and Shia Muslims. In the Friday prayers, there are, there are practices that some Shia Muslims from certain national backgrounds uh, do at Friday prayers that really annoy the Sunni Muslims. And disorder sometimes breaks out at Friday prayers. But it's not just the Muslim category within that category, just as within the Christian category and the others. Uh, you find the tensions and the difficulties, but they're forced together because if you're a Shia Muslim, but prisoner, you don't, as far as I know, in any of the prison systems that I've talked about, there are no Shia Friday prayers. There's probably not a Shia Imam either. You have to deal with the one who's there, and it's going to be a Sunni Muslim, and it's going to be probably from Pakistan or Bangladesh if you're an Indian. And therefore, the Shia are marginalized to some extent. Um, but the prison service cannot. He says it cannot afford to accommodate that level of diversity. It prefers to put all Muslims together, all Hindus or Sikhs together. Clearly, it saves them money, but it also makes it politically more uh, easier for them to do it that way because they're only dealing with one authority at a time. So you're absolutely right, our protection is a central issue here. And sometimes it's even the case of protection between different currents of faith within the same faith tradition. <clears throat> well, thank you for a very interesting uh, lecture. And thank you for bringing in the subject of uh, equality. And uh, my, uh, my question goes to, to, the, to the extent to which, uh, I guess, the, the, the whole institution of chaplaincy is fundamentally unequal yes. <laughs> to the extent yeah. that it's sort of formed within a specific Christian uh, context. And to, I mean, how do chaplains uh, from other places, I mean, how do they fit into that? Or do they find it problematic? Do they feel that they have to do something different because they have to fit into this sort of uh, function? Of, uh, well, the function and the mold, in a way. So we're talking about British prisons. It's the Anglican mold. Mm -hmm. You have to do your religion. It doesn't matter whether you are Hindu, Muslim, or Sikh. You've got to do it in a way that an Anglican would probably do it. Anglican attitude to pervade these other faith traditions because they, they want to fit in, but they want to have space to do their thing in the prison, and they know that the only way to do that is to behave like Anglicans. So the very institution of the chaplains is alien to some other faiths, but they recognize very quickly and rightly so that it was to their advantage to recognize it and to produce chaplains. So now there is a, a college in, in Britain College of Higher Education, which trains imams to work as chaplains in the health service of the prisons and in some other locations too. Um, and the model of chaplaincy that they're operating with is still recognizably an anglican model of chaplaincy. So there is. In but there is really no way to no. put it straight in that way. I mean, it's changing the legislation, changing and moving really. Beyond that. Well, for historical and cultural reasons, I think Britain is going to really struggle to do that. It, 
it has policies of multiculturalism and so forth. There are multi-faith policies within the prison system. They've gone that far, and they're well ahead of other, some other uh, Western European countries in that respect. But they're not going to ditch the Christian model of chaplains. Um, I think the when I first started investigating the American prisons, I was, I was strongly impressed <coughs> by the notion of equal faith, but sorry, equal respect for all faiths. That, that's what the Bureau of Prisons says. Equal respect for all faiths. Well, what could be better than that? That, that seemed to me the idea. And it makes the idea of me. But in practice, it doesn't seem to work out quite like that. There are all kinds of restrictions that are brought to bear. And uh, again, if they don't have the resources, they don't have the recognition, they're not going to go very far with equal respect. So I think that's still the idea. Again, when I first encountered it, I, I was favorably impressed by it. it. It did seem to me that it was a good move towards the ideal of a multi-faith chaplaincy. Uh, but the more I talked to people about it in terms of the day-to-day -day operation, the more I could see the difficulties. Um, it's, it's, it's not quite as crass as I may have implied. Um, technically, yeah, they're all generic chaplains, but they do not, for example, conduct liturgies with people of the faith other than their own. So you're not going to get a Jewish chaplain uh, conducting Friday prayers for Christmas and vice versa. That, that doesn't happen. But they talk to all the prisoners, and they provide pastoral support for all the prisoners. So any prisoner can approach any chaplain and ask for support and advice and guidance. And at that level, it seems to me it works well. I know it, it works well. There are very difficulties with that. Um, and I saw it operating. You know, Close quarters in a, literally it was a state prison, uh, but in a state prison, maximum security prison in Michigan, when I arranged for a visit, and the, the chaplain who arrived to show me around for the day was a Muslim chaplain. And he trained in Saudi Arabia, he'd been in Saudi Arabia for about 15 years, um, he'd been born in the United States, and he'd gone back to the States as, as a Muslim chaplain. But for that day, it was clear to me that he was a chaplain just like all the others in the institution. You know, Prison officers, prison guards, all respected him. You could tell that he was recognized and, and liked, I implied, by, by, by everybody that, that we met during that day. Um, so I couldn't see any difference between him and the other chaplains in, in terms of his authority in that institution. And so I, I, I think there are grounds for thinking that it does work. If there are problems of a strictly religious nature that come up, then clearly a generic chaplain then got to have somebody who is very knowledgeable and well trained in a particular faith tradition to, to deal with that. Um, and I've asked and they've assured me that there is no problem, something like that occurs, they, they find a chaplain who can deal with it, but whether they all do I don't know. Suspicious. And certainly there are theologians who are deeply suspicious of this. Uh, one British theologian in particular who described this in a, an essay in a book about chaplains as spiritual polyfill. Polyfill, you know, is that <laughs> very malleable paste that you use. You've got a crack in the wall, you fill it. Um, and he denounced all that. He, he said, this is nonsense. It's theologically nonsense now, generic chaplains. And he feared that that was sort of creeping in, uh, almost by default. And, and again, Winnie Sullivan's work kind of points towards that in the United States. But that would be another story. Um, my, my knowledge of this area is based mainly more in, in aspects of health, where actually you see remarkable parallels, where the, the health intervention is not recognized, there are no resources for it. You may not be, have access to the physician services or other people that we have in the community. 
I, I, the prison, prison institutions and prison regimes are fairly intractable. They don't change very easily. I'm interested, but there are some cases where, uh, largely, I think, at the level of practice that you've not talked about, but alluded to, where because of uh, arranged or either learning arrangements with prison guards, prison officials, and prisoners and other side advocates, change happens. Mm -hmm. Where have you seen uh, kind of a shifts in systems for a greater recognition that is that actually gives more value, due value to all those aspects of religious yeah. diversity? And how has it happened? It happens as a result of a lot of uh, political negotiation, lobbying in some respects. Uh, for example, a very prominent member of the British House of Lords um, who became a Buddhist during his adult life became a uh, very effective advocate for the Buddhist prison service chaplains and Buddhist monarchs. As a result of which, uh, in part at least, a, a large number of British prisons now have Buddha stupas. They have little meditation areas and uh, prisoners can gather from around the Buddha stupas. That's extraordinary. Um, but he did it through constantly uh, advocating this and lobbying the ministers in the, uh, in the Home Office, now the Ministry of Justice, in charge of prisons. And, and he was successful. So it requires that kind of effort, I think, to bring it off. Okay. Another case would be the case of the pagan chapels in, in British prisons, which didn't exist until a few years ago. But again, the pagan federation. Put a lot of pressure on politicians and other decision makers, and they, they eventually got the pagan chaplaincy accepted. But when you look at the, the religion manual, that big book of recipes that I'm talking about, there is a section in there on paganism, and it tells you exactly what a pagan prisoner registered as a pagan is allowed to have in his or her cell, and what that prisoner is allowed to do, and what the diet may be affected, etc. It's, it's all there. It all had to be negotiated. And uh, characteristic, I think, of, of British politics, it was done through negotiation with the pagan federation in government. Just select that body as being the most representative body for pagans. But there were other pagans who were not very happy about that. These issues about representation are quite complex, politically very sensitive. But it worked, they got there. Whereas Scientology is not got there. Uh, Rastafarianism has not got there. And the nation is not as aesthetic as really British prisons. And uh, you certainly wouldn't see that in any French prison um, In the United States, you can certainly find them. Um, but they still feel that they are not um, dealt with equitably. Particularly the nation of Islam still complains that they don't have as many imams as the Sunni Muslims that they are. And they don't. That's why you have all the I'm just wondering if you see the potential existence of a relationship between religious freedom and the prisons and the rehabilitation office. Is something going on there that you could talk about? Yeah, rehabilitation. Well, this is this is the, um, the holy grail. I mean, everybody's been looking for this <laughs> for centuries in prison chapters. And, and the um, British system is actually based on Anglican initially it, it uh, went through a phase of insisting on you know, individual treatment, the isolation of prisoners, uh, feeling that if they were kept strictly to themselves in solitary confinement, they would reflect on their soul and the condition of their soul and they would become better people and then when they were released, if they were ever released, then they would fit better back into the community. That, that was the theory and it had an Anglican theology behind it. In practice, um, there's no evidence to suggest that that is the case. There is a great deal of activity in the United States among criminologists to try to ascertain precisely what the input of religion is into uh, the prevention of recidivism, the, the repeated effects. And after a huge amount of research, we're still going on with very, very sophisticated statistical analysis. I think the conclusion is that being religious in a prison only 